Hello, welcome to the Millionaire Woman Show, where we'll be discussing leadership, business, and human potential, inspiring you to live rich from the inside out. Unlock your creativity, stretch out of your comfort zone, break through your barriers, take inspired action, and achieve epic results. Now, Here's your host, two-time best-selling author, speaker, and certified executive coach, Deborah Kosowski. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Millionaire Woman Show, where we speak about topics of leadership, business, and human potential to help you live your life rich from the inside out. Today, I have Teresa DeGrobois is a number one international best-selling author of Mass Influence, The Habits of the Highly Influential, which is now a bestseller in seven countries. A four-time international best-selling author, Teresa teaches marketing courses around the globe to corporations, entrepreneurs, on how to create massive successfully word-of-mouth campaigns. Teresa heads the International Evolutionary Business Council, a global community of speakers and influencers dedicated to teaching the principles of success. And please uh, let me welcome you to this special t call and this today's guest, Teresa de Grobois. And, and I am just, she used word of mouth ep epidemics to take her own four books to international best selling status. And Teresa, thank you so much for being here and welcome to our show. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And I need to as is that I'm down in Costa Rica for the winter. I spend my winters down here. So the walls are thin. You might hear the odd howler monkey or rooster <laughs> or a crazy loud parrot in the background. So we'll ho hopefully we'll just uh, move forward if that happens. Excellent. You take us away with you. So yeah. I'm just going to jump right in and tell us a little bit about yourself and what really brought you to studying influence. You know, I think for me, like a lot of people, you know, we often don't know what we're really good at until it sort of smacks us in the face. And, um, you know, for me, I had a period of my life where, uh, you know, I, I had had a lot of outward success. I came up through the oil and gas sector in Canada had been a leader in several organizations, um, often leading huge change initiatives, but I wasn't loving it, you know? And then I had my really bad year, what I affectionately call my really bad year. I can smile about it now, because I know it was one of the best things that ever happened to me. But in the first six months of that year, I had my father had passed away, my health was in a tailspin, my company had failed, and my marriage had ended. And, uh, I remember actually there was a specific morning, I'm sitting in the, the condo in the, in the bathroom of, you know, my post-marriage breakup condo, and uh, this bathroom, you know, I've always been a renovator, so this bathroom is going to be my latest project, and I'm surrounded by tools, and I'm bawling my eyes out because the only thought in my head is that it's me that needs renovating. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was such a powerful moment because it was the moment I decided that I'm going to be my next project, forget the tools. And I really got serious about really working on my own stuff and, and really looking at who do I really want to be in the world and where do I want to go. And um, the cool thing about having a moment like that is it really shakes up your world to the core. And, you know, within two years of that, I had completely remade my life um, to the point where you know, I discovered what I was really good at, which is teaching other people how to create movements in the world, teaching other people how to create word of mouth epidemics. And um, I've really never looked back since. It's been pretty awesome. Wow. Yeah. You know, when we hear the word influence, um, some people will hear the word influence and they'll think, mm, those people always get what they want. Mm. What does the word influence mean to you? Yeah, well, influence is really do a lot of people know, like, and trust, or do, does people know, like, and trust you, right? You all have some level of influence in your life, right? And, and mass influence is just do a lot of people know, like, and trust you, you know? I like to compare influence to breathing. And that might sound like a weird analogy at first, right? But you actually had to learn the skill of breathing when you were first born. You know, most of you cried. 
Uh, it was deeply uncomfortable. You were like, what the heck are these people doing pulling me out of that nice warm environment and my lungs hurt. And then a few moments later, you mastered the skill of breathing and you probably never thought about it again until those key moments where maybe your partner or your best friend had to say, remember to breathe, honey. And, um, but by and large, breathing became something that you did 24-7 without ever thinking about it. And influence is actually a lot like that. It is, in fact, a skill. And it's a skill you can learn. And a lot of people struggle in it until they actually really get the paradigm shift of what it is. But influential people go, don't go around 24 hours a day saying, oh, my God, now I have to put time on my calendar to think about operating as an influential person. Yeah. No, they simply do the skills and the habits that influential people tend to do. And they do them routinely without thinking about them and therefore their influence grows. So why is it um, that, what holds people back from being influential? They might think that at times that they can be, and then all of a sudden you see that they're not. What's, what's happening with that? Well, you know, there's two key things that hold people back. Um, first and foremost, you know, we all learned a skill set for networking in business um, that tends to work against you when you start networking with the highly influential, right? Like, for example, we all learned it's a good idea to offer to buy a colleague a coffee, um, and yet you only have to phone up the CEO of a Fortune 500 company and offer to buy them a coffee, and faster than you can say restraining order, <laughs> you're going to find out pretty quick that there's a different set of rules that apply to the highly influential, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing that tends to stop people. The second thing is more profound and deeper, and that is that as human beings, we all tend to invent a set of self-limiting beliefs. There's a lot of research that shows that most of us invent our biggest self-limiting beliefs in the first years of our life when we're first learning language. Mm -hmm. And when we feel called to step up into leadership to really do something that makes a difference, to create change, that is the act that most fires up your negative self-talk. Nothing will challenge you more than thinking about stepping in your own dreams, in fact. And, um, and therefore, your negative self-talk blares the loudest in the moments that count the most. In fact, one of the reasons I wrote my book was because I really wanted to, to get it in the hands of good people everywhere because the only people that don't have a lot of negative self-talk that stops them from stepping into influence and leadership tend to be sociopaths. They have inner dialogue of a different sort. And, you know, so if good people don't learn to overcome that negative self-talk and really step into the places that matter to them to lead and create change, and really what's at risk is we risk leaving behind a world run by the very leaders that we fear. Mm. What is some of the negative self-talk that you have come up against for yourself or what you have commonly heard amongst leaders? Um, you know, for me, I, I can actually remember the day I created... Uh, my biggest negative self-talk. You know, I'm, I'm probably three years old, and what you wouldn't know about me if I didn't tell you is I'm actually from northern Canada. I'm, I'm from northern Ontario. And uh, we used to spend our summers in a remote backwood cabin. We'd go in every year by boat just in time to see the hatching of the little baby mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I'm the youngest of nine kids. So one day we're just back from the cabin, and we're all crammed into the kitchen of our little, little tiny 100-year-old house. And all my cousins are visiting, and the room is just buzzing with excitement because my grandmother's taking us all to the movies, which is a really big freaking deal in my family because my staunchly Catholic mother is seriously concerned about the morals of Hollywood movie makers. But somebody's finally convinced mom that Walt Disney's not the worst guy on the planet, and she's letting us go see the love bug, right? And three-year-old me is just buzzing with excitement. And I look across the room just in time to watch mom say, Teresa can't go, she's too little. Oh. I know, like three-year-old me is utterly devastated in that moment. And I tell myself, I'm too small to play with the big kids. Mm -hmm. And that inner dialogue sticks. And as human beings will do, I then start routinely doing one of two things, desperately trying to prove it's not true, or desperately terrified that it is. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you can imagine that that could get in the way when I have to step on stage in front of 500 people, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, but the reality is, you know, I can actually give your, your listeners a, a, a takeaway if you like. Would that help? Absolutely. Uh, 
Okay, so here's the best exercise to look at this, and I really love this one. It's um, for the next seven days, journal what comes up for you when you think about playing a bigger game or really stepping up to lead. Journal what that inner dialogue is. It might be, I'm not smart enough, I'm not good at speaking in public, uh, I get stage fright, it might be I'm not important, I'm not lovable, I'm too small to play with the big kids, but you've got something and journal what it is. And then scan back over your life and see if you can find other times when that came up for you. In fact, if you can go back to that first time and meet that little boy or little girl who created that, that's really powerful. Now here's where the juice is in this exercise. Journal where it hinders you and journal where it helps you. Because hmm. your inner dialogue is not good or bad, it just is. You know, I'm too small to play with the big kid motivated me to, to make importance an important conversation in my life at the age of three, right? Go figure that I would become a global authority on the topic of influence and work with change agents all over the world to help learn how to create movements and create change, right? So, you know, it's not about beating up your inner child. It's about learning to appreciate that you can use your inner dialogue to motivate you and you can quell it in those moments where it's stopping you. And the way to quell it is an exercise I call channeling your inner elder. Just imagine a really awesome, sexy, vibrant, older version of yourself, maybe 10 years older than you are now, yeah. and channel that version of you, just telling that little inner child inside you that it's okay, that you can handle this. And that, you know, they're welcome to go play in the sandbox while you handle this situation. Um, but you've got it. You know, the little inner child doesn't have to stand on stage in front of 500 people or, or be the person that goes for the big promotion at work um, or takes the outrageous risk in business. Your inner elder can do that because just like you have an inner child, you have an inner elder too. It's pretty powerful because I'm thinking about, uh, it's about two years ago that I really realized that I had that story as well. And my story was about that I was eight years old and mm -hmm. I had made a gift and I wanted to give it to a family member. And we had a tragic event happen in our family. And mm -hmm. um, they were out, you know, trying to ensure that he comes in for, for Christmas. And I was waiting and waiting with my gift. I was hiding in the bathroom and and every time the door would open, I'd run out and I said, now, is it time to share my gift? And they say, no, 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 Deborah, not now. Mm -hmm. And then I'd go away again and then I'd come out and, and is it time to share my gift? No, Deborah, it's not the right time. So mm -hmm. I had taken that message and I didn't even realize and just tell a few years ago that I had put that message mm -hmm. um, in my hard drive and it kept saying, you know, now's not the time to share your gift. So I can see there's times where I've stepped into it and there's times where I have pulled back on some of the gifts that I have. And mm -hmm. uh, now that you recognize that, you can say, you know what? No more of this. I, yeah. I know that I can take these gifts and share them with other people. Yeah, beautiful. So it is powerful. Very, very powerful. So yeah. I, I highly recommend uh, what Teresa is saying about the journaling because you will be surprised at, you know, mm. and it's a single event and it just blows me away that I don't remember anything from three years old. So. Yeah. <laughs> so that's well, all. and you know, we often end up repeating the same incident over and over again in our life. So there might have even been an earlier version of that one, you yeah, know, but, that's, but yeah, that's they, very they happen early and they stick. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't realize that we've had hung on to that message until we actually stop and do some reflection. Yeah, very true. So as a leader, how do you grow more leaders in the leadership mindset so you can spend more time uh, on your plate, so you can have that more time on your focus? Well, you know, it really is about knowing what's that vision in your heart, right? And then enrolling people in, in joining you in that vision. It's all about creating team, right? One of, one of the biggest parts of creating a movement or creating a word of mouth epidemic around something is who's got your back, you know? And a lot of that is about what relationships do you build with others? One of the most important things you can ever do in an influenced conversation is be someone else's first raving fan. 
when you give influence to others who deserve it, you have the ability to turn a, a lone raving nut waving their hands on a hill into a leader. Right? And so when you cause leadership in others, when you cause other people to be influential by endorsing them, by praising them, by bringing their good work to other people's attention, you're actually in the act of giving influence to others. It's one of the greatest forms of leadership there is. And the cool thing about it is it's in the act of you giving influence to others that you become more influential yourself. Because in that moment, you become the leader who causes leaders. And you can bet anyone you do that with is going to turn right around and endorse you and praise you because that's the normal human response to that is that when we receive influence, we give it right back. Yeah. And one of the most powerful things for me, because I, I wanted to make sure that, because I've watched it a few times, but last night I was watching it in bed and watching your TED Talk. Oh, and thank you. It was, it was awesome how you engage the audience, but you had one pivotal moment in that whole presentation where you gave influence to an audience member. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, you know, um, it was actually a little bit spontaneous um, in that I just decided to do that that morning. And, um, but, you know, Dave Bonk uh, is a dear friend of mine who runs a, a big charity in Canada called Hearts and Hammers. And the work they do is they go out and uh, they engage volunteers to renovate homes for people who become wheelchair bound so that they can go back and live with their families. Like, so they'll put in ramps and wheelchair lifts or whatever's necessary so that they're not separated from their families. And uh, it's work that really deeply inspires me because it's the kind of non-glorious work that often people don't think about doing. And yet they've had impacts on hundreds, uh, probably approaching thousands of families now um, just by starting this little not-for-profit. And uh, I thought, well, I got to demonstrate what this looks like. Let me find the person here I think is most worthy. And um, it just happened to be that day that Dave Bonk, who's actually an old friend of mine, happened to show up. And I, I just knew the minute I saw him, he's the guy I got to talk about on TED because I get deeply moved and deeply emotional when I think about how courageous the work he is doing in the world is. And uh, so I love him to bits. And, and it was... Um, a really profound moment. I looked over at him when I did it and he just welled up with tears. He was like, I can't believe you just spoke about me on TED. Thank you. Yeah. And it was pretty, pretty special. Yeah. But I think it was an excellent example, a live example. And that spontaneity, I yeah. think what makes your TED Talk more unique than any other TED Talk that I've ever watched is because oh, you added you. something that wasn't rehearsed. And it had this extra flavor, but it was a live example for the audience to realize how influence actually works. Mm, thank you. So what has inspired the mass influence, the habits of the highly influential that came out in October of 2015? What inspired you? You know, I think what really inspired me was that I see a lot of really good people, everyday heroes, you know, wanting, out, wanting to get out there and do good things in the world. And somehow they feel like their work is not important or they're not worthy. And they don't realize the magnitude of the shift that they can create on this planet, you know. Um, you know, a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that something small and local isn't that significant on the planet. You know, if you look at Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a lot of people think he stood in the conversation of solving racial inequality. And while that's not untrue, what he really did was he went after an unfair busting system for, you know, underprivileged African Americans living in Montgomery, Alabama. That was the cause that he really took on initially that got him global fame. Mm. You know, and so it's sometimes those small and local grassroots movements like the Dave Bonks of the world that just say, enough already, look at there's hundreds of thousands of families in our country that are separated because somebody's become wheelchair bound and they can't afford to, to you know, fix their home so that that person come back, can come back and live with their family. And, and now it's, it's causing people into the welfare system that shouldn't be. Yeah. And um, it's sometimes those small, simple, practical, everyday grassroots movements that cause the biggest shift on this planet. And I think when we get that, that 
drawing attention to the everyday heroes and actually creates you as an everyday hero when you're someone who does that. You know, I love the work you do, Deborah. Um, you're such a contribution to women and women understanding, you know, financial freedom and financial health. It's such an important part of life. And it's an area I see so many women struggle in, mm -hmm. you know, and I, you know, I, truthfully, I would come on your show any day of the week, right? Because <laughs> it's authentic for me. You know, giving influence is not about randomly bigging up anyone you can think of, even if it's not authentic for you to do it. No, it's about finding the people you deeply love and shouting it from the rooftops. You know, I do 30 or 40 interviews a week. Um, I also turn down 10 to 12 because they're people I don't resonate with, right? Yeah. But it's easy for me to come on your show and say, oh my God, Deborah Kozowski, she's freaking brilliant. Look at the work she does, look how many women she helps, right? It's a mutual love there, Teresa. Aw, uh, thank you, you know? And, but really, that's what influence is about. Find those people that you deeply love and respect yeah. and shout their workout from the rooftops. Guess what's going to happen? They're going to start shouting out your dream and shouting out your mission from the rooftops too if you've got the courage to step into it and move forward. So this brings a question to me, to mind as we're talking. So we want to influence those everyday heroes, but so often we hear that we can't be a prophet in our own land. Yeah, it's very I'm true. About that when it comes to influence. Yeah, it's very true. The further you are from home, the smarter people think you are. Um, so it often is easier to be known and accepted when you move further from your own home community, right? But here's the kicker. You know, let's say you're living in Edmonton, Alberta, and you have some small grassroots movement you're starting. I can bet dollars to donuts that there's someone in Birmingham, England, really trying to do the same thing. And when you find them on Facebook and shout them out, now they've been endorsed by someone who's known in this field in Canada. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you just gave that person with that little grassroots movement huge influence. And guess what's going to happen? That little grandmother or whoever from Birmingham, England, is now going to turn around and endorse your grassroots movement in Edmonton. Suddenly you're an internationally endorsed movement. So it's not as difficult as you might think to make connections, especially in this day and age. The internet has really been a miracle for society in that way. You know, whatever your cause is, whatever that thing is that you wish you could improve in the world, you can connect yourself up with other people with that similar drive and that similar notion. And, you know, as long as you don't believe in competition, I mean, competition is a fun thing that humanity created, but it doesn't have to exist. You know, the reality is in the influence conversation, if we all just help each other, everybody gets a lot bigger and a lot more influential. And that leads me to a question I was thinking about this morning as well. And it was about when it comes to influence, what do we have to do differently when it comes to competition versus collaboration? Well, it's, it's really, I would invite you to consider that there is no competition. Like, even if you look at those who live in a competitive mindset, like Coke and Pepsi invented the Cola Wars, guess who won that game? They both did. They both ended up 20 times bigger than either company existed in, in sales before they created the Cola Wars, right? So, you know, competition is based on a notion that there are limited resources and we're competing for them. And the reality is there are very few things in this world that are, in fact, truly limited. And certainly the attention and endorsement of others is not one of those commodities. Um, you can give out influence in an unlimited fashion. The world can bear more than one expert in the same conversation. In fact, when those experts start endorsing each other, the whole conversation gets a whole lot bigger and everybody gets a lot more excited about it. Or even when those experts engage in healthy debate. But the more you connect yourself up with other like-minded individuals that would cause the same shift, the same change, even if you're a company owner, like what's that problem your company solves? Um, what's that thing that your career is about? Uh, what problem do you solve for the world? Connect yourself with other people with similar like-minded thinking to solve problems mm -hmm. and you'll all become a lot more influential. 
Thank you for that one. Um, you talk about habits and how people consistently are good at generating the influence exhibit. Can you share um, a few of those with my audience? Well, you know, I think the first and foremost is to really think about it, and I've alluded to this a couple times. What problem do you solve for the world? You know, and because a lot of people, they make their buying decisions on, they either want or need something, or it, it, it's either a want or a need, right? So it's something they really want or something they really need. And when you're in the conversation of need, it's what problem do you solve for me? And the fact is 80% of buying decisions are in fact a need, not a want. And when I say buying decision, I'm not just talking to business owners because there's also a, a conversation that happens in big organizations or even in communities or even in families where people are making sales. You're trying to convince someone of something and somebody has a need or a want they want addressed and somebody over here can solve it or not solve it. But when you can start thinking in the realm of, am I solving a want or a need? And most often it is a need. What problem do you solve for the world when you can speak in the language of problem people get you a lot quicker. And a lot of, you know, people who've done a lot of inner self work, the, the land of the conscious, I call it, you know, those who've really done their work, resist speaking in the language of problem. Because, you know, we all train ourselves to be really positive minded. A lot of leaders are very positive minded thinking individuals. So we tra train ourselves to speak in the language of solution. But there is an appropriate time and place to be able to speak in the language of problem because you can't help someone up out of the mud unless you wade into the mud puddle. Somebody going through divorce does not know they need meditation, for example. They think they need a solution to, why is that jerk treating me so badly, right? So when you speak in the language of problem, you meet people where they're at, then you can take them to the solution that you know they need. Okay, so how do you decide what to focus on? Like, how do you find that giant thing that's great value to other people? Well, it's usually a combination of what are you really good at and what do you really love? And uh, often if you look to what's the biggest challenge you've ever overcome in life, maybe it's cancer, maybe it's bankruptcy, uh, maybe it's that you were raised in extremely impoverished conditions. But look at what those really big challenges are that you've overcome somewhere amidst the, those conversations. What do you love? What are you good at? What challenges have you overcome? There is something that would really drive you. What's the one miracle that you would create for the world if you could? And it can be small and local or big and global. Although if it's big and global, I would you know, encourage you to consider finding a way to make it more specific, right? Because the more specific it is, the easier it is for people to follow you and come at you and want your help. And you'll find you end up with supporters and people who are assisting you all over the map, you know? I often see this with health practitioners, you know, they'll say, well, my brand is I'm all about health or longevity, which are great, wonderful, pro positive words. They are a want for many people, but more people make their health buying decisions based on a need. Uh, they need a solution to back pain or they need arthritic cure or specifically they need ar arthritis for the lower spine uh, or they have a um, cancer, or even more specifically, they have bone cancer, or breast cancer, or prostate cancer. And when you can actually say, I am specifically an expert in that problem for these people, the opposite of what you think would happen happens. People start coming at you in droves because people want a specialist in their pain or their problem. Mm -hmm. And it's important whether you're running your own company or whether you're a, a leader in someone else's business, to understand that what problem do you solve and who do you solve it for? That's very important. Mm -hmm. And I know you talk about authenticity a lot. So how much does authenticity play into the game of influence? Well, authenticity is really the key, right? And there's a lot of different definitions of authenticity out there. Here's mine. Authenticity is just your inside voice saying the same thing as your outside voice. In other words, your thoughts and your words and actions are all in alignment. And, you know, we've all seen those circumstances where somebody was, you know, saying, this is a really great car, you can buy it, and we know what's going on behind their ears is, I really got to pay my rent, please make this sale, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the technical term we use for that is schmarmy, right? Mm -hmm. 
And so, you know, really think about it. If you're not doing something you love or you're not playing with people you deeply admire, then you've got a disconnect between what's going on between your ears and what's coming out of your mouth. Uh, you've got an inauthenticity problem. You're landing schmarmy everywhere. The best thing you can do around authenticity is give yourself permission to step into your own dreams. And, and this is where your inner dialogue is really going to flare up, right? Because your dreams are scarier to you than they are to anyone else on the planet because they're your dreams. That's freaking huge, right? Pardon me, I'm French-Canadian. I talk with my hands. <laughs> But that's, it's huge, right? And yet at the same time, nobody's going to be more hardwired to live your own dreams than you because you're going to be more passionate about them. You will be more authentic in that realm than anyone else on this planet. So channel your inner elder and step into your dreams because that's where your influence resides. Thank you for that. That is awesome. Now, I know that... In the game of influence, you've probably seen a lot of big mistakes happen when it comes to building relationships. Can you share a few? <laughs> yeah. Actually, I think the most common I would affectionately call the premature ask. I say ask clearly because people always go, the premature what? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the premature ask is, is like the equivalent of you've just met the new neighbor and they come by and ask to borrow the lawn more. You know, and we see this at networking functions all the time, you know, at any given networking function, the most influential people is usually the speaker on stage and they'll walk off stage and there'll be a lineup of people waiting there to offer to buy them a coffee or a lunch or with a book or a CD in hand or wanting to give them a product sample of some sort. And, you know, offering to buy an influential person coffee or offering them a product sample is a lot like going to the new neighbor you just met. And saying, you're going to so love my kids. You're so going to enjoy babysitting them. <laughs> you know, and that may be true. You know, you might have the best kids on the planet, but that's all about you. And, you know, it's, it's way too soon for that conversation. You want to get in relationship with an influential person, offer something first. Don't make the first conversation all about you. Mm -hmm. And... So you've talked about how to become a top authority in your field. Mm -hmm. What's the secret to doing that? Well, here's the secret sauce. You know, when you can make yourself a hub of the influential people in any conversation, you gain the influence level of all the people you help. You know, um, one of the reasons I was inspired to create the Evolutionary Business Council was that I saw a lot of really great people out wanting to cause change in the world that didn't really understand how to play the influence game. And I, I thought, let me bring them all together so that they can help each other and learn. And what I hadn't really thought about at the time was how awesome it would be to lead an organization of highly influential people. The Evolutionary Business Council is a collective reach of over 50 million people. It's actually a humbling honor to be able to create the context for that, you know? Um, when my book went up in pre-sales, I had so many amazing, wonderful, heroic people in my life that the book went bestseller within three hours of being on the pre-sale page. And it had, had hit number one in four countries by the next day. I didn't plan that. I just had this army of amazing, incredible people that I'm in deep relationship that wouldn't shut up about my book, right? Yeah. And I still get a little emotional talking about it, actually. I get a little choked up. But when you can make yourself of service to highly influential people in the realm you're in, whether you create a networking group for them or, you know, create a, a show where you're routinely interviewing them, but do something to be of service of the people you admire and bring them together, connect them in some way, that actually creates the collective level of influence that they have starts to become yours. And you will find your influence grows exponentially as a result. I've watched your Evolutionary Business Council grow, and it's been phenomenal to watch how you have stepped into such a beautiful place of service, and you are such a champion for every single member. And I've Thank appreciated you. watching that, and you've also, you know, endorsed me, and, and uh I love you for that, and I love it that it comes from your heart. You're so genuine about what you give to people, 
And mm -hmm. I, I want to ensure that uh, if people want to learn about influence, they need to get a hold of your book. They need to start following you. So um, I know there's going to be listeners who want support in this area of influence who really want to know um, how do I become a top um, influencer in my industry? How do I get access to more? Can you tell us about that? Well, if you'd like a free copy of my book, um, we give the digital version away from, for free. So um, I also have a 30-day influence challenge on the same site. So if you want to practice the skills of influence, we give you quick little two-minute exercises every day. So you can go to massinfluencethebook.com and the, the free 30-day influence challenge are there and all the links where you can get my book. The digital version is for free or if you prefer to purchase a hard copy or the Audible, you can find the links for where you can get those there as well. Awesome. And how else can they reach you if they want to send you an email and tell you how your book has influenced their lives? You know what? I love it if you connect with me on Facebook. I'm on Facebook every day. Facebook's my thing. Um, so feel free to reach out on Facebook, Teresa de Grobois on Facebook, um, that's T-E-R-E-S-A-D-E-G-R-O-S-B-O-I-S, -E -E um, or just, you know, reach out on LinkedIn. I love to connect. Thank you for joining us today, Teresa, on the Millionaire Woman Show. Our guests, you're going to have to replay this one to just capture all the nuggets that Teresa has shared with us. Make sure you're following her on social media. Um, also, tell them about the Evolutionary Business Council, how they can follow you guys on Twitter, because I know you have a lot of fan base on there as well. Yeah, we're EB Council on Twitter, so uh, feel free to check us out there too. Yeah. They are always out there inspiring, and Teresa is a number one best-selling author internationally. She is a huge influencer, and you want to learn how to be part of that influence game. It really will help you get to the next level because if you keep doing what you're always doing and Teresa already talked you can't give everybody that cup of coffee not as you grow and get to the next level it's not going to serve you so we'd love for you to share this episode with your friends help them become influencers as well and reach out to us let us know what you've gained from this podcast um, message Teresa message myself uh, you can email me at Deborah at Deborah and Teresa your email that's available oh, or the way to reach you? Do you have a contact? Sure. You can email me at Teresa at wildfirews.com. Awesome. Everyone, remember, as I always say, if you want change to happen, you need to be the change you want to be in the world, as Gandhi said. And, and until we talk again, make today great. Mm -hmm.